our spiritual life team of the Wyoming Interfaith Network. And we uh, aim to, in this series, have conversations with practitioners, leaders, and experts about religion and faith in the equality state. We seek to celebrate, educate, and have conversations about our rich spiritual and religious diversity. Our goal is to uh, not educate as I said, or is to educate as I said, excuse me, um, but not to convert. Um, we uh, in, we uh, par encourage your participation. Um, we will have some time towards the end of the presentation as it allows for question and answer. And once again, you can put that in the chat box below. So uh, without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's guest. Uh, we are happy to be joined by Rabbi Zalman Mendelson of Chabad, Wyoming and Jackson uh, as he presents about Jewish life in Wyoming. And if you could hear me for a second, Rabbi, I'll read a bit of your, uh, of, of your introduction, if that's okay, so people can get an idea of who you are. So Rabbi Mendelson is the co-director of Hobad Jewish Center in Wyoming. He's raised in Miami Beach and received a bachelor's degree in Talmudic study, 2002 from the Rabbinical College of America. He later received his rabbinic ordination from the Central Chabad Rabbinical Council in Israel. From 2004 through 2006, he taught introductory courses in Jewish philosophy, biblical analysis, and Talmudic law at the Rabbinical College of America. His weekly telephone Torah classes attract young and old from around the globe. He has served in a number of Jewish communities around the world, including China, France, Israel, Nepal, Russia, Singapore, and Thailand, and as well as many communities across the United States. Rabbi Mendelson co-directs the Chabad Jewish Center with his wife and partner, Razi Mendelson. Rabbi, it is great to see you and we look forward to hearing from you tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jordan, very much. And thank you to the Wyoming Interfaith Network for the wonderful work that you do to bring people together for a common purpose of making this world a better place through the lens of religion, each person on their own, each religion in its own way uniquely position to be able to make the great state of Wyoming the beautiful tapestry of religious values that it has to offer to so many people. Uh, Jordan, it is a great pleasure to be joined with you and with the many people that are here with us. Thank you for organizing this gathering. As was mentioned, um, my name is Rabbi Zalman Mendelssohn and I moved here to Jackson, Wyoming in 2007 together with my wife. And it's been a wonderful journey ever since we got here. It's been a welcoming, wonderful community, both the Jewish community and beyond. And it is a unique privilege to be serving as a rabbi here in Wyoming. Uh, currently, uh, unfortunately, with the passing of Rabbi Larry Maldo, who many of you had the privilege of knowing a wonderful leader in the community in Wyoming, I currently, unfortunately, serve as the only rabbi in the state, and I hope that that will be rectified shortly, and we'll have many more rabbis to serve in the state of Wyoming going forward. But as part of my religious duties as a member of the Jewish clergy, I have the unique opportunity to be able to travel around the state of Wyoming to visit Jewish communities all across the state, and I do my best to visit the communities in Cheyenne, in Laramie, and in Casper at least once a year. Um, and oftentimes it's every quarter that I visit. We also send rabbinical students, young rabbis to travel across the state to bring the beauty, warmth, and love of Jewish tradition to people all across the state. And as you know, it is not part of our tradition to even seek conversions beyond this podium, beyond this platform, in Jewish tradition, it is not one of our values to seek to convert other people because we believe that every human being is created uniquely in God's image and has a unique capacity to be able to reach their God-given talents without having to become Jewish in order to be able to accomplish that. I'd like to begin by just sharing with you some interesting things about my perspective on the unique experience of Jewish people in the state of Wyoming through my prism, through my lens. Obviously, every person has their own experience, but I'll share my own just because it's the only one that I really know. So 
ever since we moved here in 2007, one of the uh, things that we sought to be able to do is to be able to bring beyond just within the Jewish community our traditions and values and to bring people together with that goal. We sought to be able to educate and to create opportunities for non-Jewish people as well to experience the richness of Jewish tradition. In fact, today, as a perfect example, Governor Gordon signed, as governors before him, before him have, a proclamation honoring March 24th, which is coming up in a couple of days from now, as Education and Shearing Day Wyoming. This was a tradition that in fact started with the presidency of Jimmy Carter and Congress since the late 70s, where every president since then, each and every year, has honored the day of the Lubavitcher Rebbe's birth date as Education and Shearing Day. The Lubavitcher Rebbe of blessed memory, my mentor, and a great giant of a spiritual leader, dedicated his entire life towards furthering education, both within the Jewish community and beyond. And one of our goals, which I'm currently working on, and I invite others to join me in this effort as well, is to be able to institute and implement a value that he sought to be able to accomplish within public schools and schools generally, to begin each day with a moment of silence. That moment of silence was not designed to be able to pray, it was not designed to be able to preach. It was not designed to be able to infuse any particular religious value on the school or on the children, but rather to give children an opportunity to reflect, to meditate, to connect with something deeper th than themselves. And if asked, what should we do during this minute of silence at the beginning of the school day, the administrators, teachers, and principals should urge the children to ask their parents what to think about allowing each child to experience their family values and the deepest ones as such. Every family has their own unique values. Some families come from one religion or another or no religion at all. But this moment gives an opportunity in a chaotic world where so much is going on and so many challenges are coming in front of children's eyes starting from such a young age without any time to be able to stop and reflect and to meditate and to think. Who am I? What's my purpose in this world? What contribution can I possibly make during my short 70, 80, 90, 100 years on this planet? This is a moment to reflect and it enables children to think about the greater society beyond themselves and to think how they can contribute to it as a whole. This value of education is something that has been honored by presidents, as I said, since Jimmy Carter, every president every year on the Lubavitcher Rebbe's birthday. And we started doing this several years back in Wyoming, starting with Governor Mead and now with Governor Gordon. The reason why I bring this up is not to be able to just merely highlight the great contribution of Lubavitcher Rebbe and his values, but to also emphasize how the state of Wyoming has been solidly caring about uh, instituting and sharing and, and enlivening and incorporating Jewish ideals and Jewish values, not just on a person-to-person -person level, but in fact on a state level. This brings me to the next thing that I think is very appropriate <clears throat> as part of my experience here in Wyoming since 2007, starting from Governor Friedenthal, a Democrat, and moving along to Governors Meade and Governor Gordon, Every year since we moved here, we've had a grand menorah lighting ceremony in which political leaders, religious leaders, activists of all kinds, the Jewish community in Cheyenne and Laramie and the Jewish community throughout the state of Wyoming have come together to be able to celebrate the holiday of Hanukkah. As many of you know, the holiday of Hanukkah is an ancient one, but in Wyoming, we continue to celebrate it today. And this is not just done by the governors, each consecutive one since our arrival over here, but rather it's been done with all of the support of political leaders from both parties in order to be able to emphasize 
how the Jewish community is a sacred one. It's an important one. It offers a great contribution to the state of Wyoming. And this has been celebrated and honored by, by the political leadership in the state of Wyoming. I think it's important to notice this. I think it's important to emphasize this. And I think it's important to express our gratitude and appreciation for the great state that we live in where people can come together of all backgrounds and share with one another the richness of their heritage, enabling people that come from different backgrounds to be able to experience that heritage as well. And finally, just on a short note, and then I'll open it up to questions and answers because I think that the greatest um, opportunity over here is to be able to engage with one another. And I encourage you to type in your questions into the chat box or type in your question, send it to Jordan. But finally, the 4th of July. And this is a story that I think deserves a lot of, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a special story, let's put it that way. For the past five years, we at the Chabad Jewish Center of Wyoming have joined the great 4th of July parade here in Jackson Hall. It's a parade that brings together some four or 5,000 people. There are many floats. There are many different parade things that people drive in, interesting old cars, funny cars, horses, et cetera, et cetera. People walk their dogs, roller skate, rollerblade, bike. It's a family gathering, and it's a time to celebrate the greatness of this country, this blessed country that has welcomed Jewish people wholeheartedly, inclusively, enabled us to partake in the great American dream. And 4th of July, each and every year, for the past five years, we have a wonderful float. We call it the Fnum Menorah. And it's this huge menorah that we place on a flatbed that is donated to us each and every year by a local Muslim fellow. This guy is a dear friend of ours in the community, Mr. Darwish. He owns many businesses here in town. He's a celebrated member of the community and he's Muslim. And oftentimes the stories that we read in the newspaper, particularly globally, seek to emphasize the separation that we have between one another and try to highlight the di discord, the wars, the fighting, the bickering and the battles that are going on throughout the world. Over here in Jackson and throughout Wyoming, what we experience is exactly the opposite the brotherly love, the sisterly love, the community, the neighborliness. Over here in Jackson, you have a religious Orthodox rabbi celebrating the 4th of July with the support and care of a religious Muslim. And to me, this is really the story of Wyoming in a nutshell. We have many wonderful friends in the Christian community who are, have been incredibly supportive of the work that we do and have enabled us to be able to reach the great achievements that we've been able to have in every segment of society. In fact, I study on a weekly basis with a uh, Christian pastor, Hebrew reading, and we have wonderful relationships with many Christian leaders throughout the state of Wyoming. And then you have a small but important mem membership and, and community members in our community, the Muslim population. They're not often recognized and realized for the contributions that they make, but their contributions are noticed by the people who certainly know them. And finally, the Jewish community. And all of these communities coming together to be able to celebrate what America stands for, what Wyoming stands for, to live and let live, to celebrate one another's greatness, to appreciate the diversity that we have. This, in essence, is the story of Wyoming. This, in essence, is the story of our experience here as the co-director of the Chabad Jewish Center of Wyoming, the important ability to be able to come together from a variety of backgrounds and do things that support the community as a whole. And so with that, I think that I'm sure many of you have questions. We're coming up now to the holiday of Passover, starting this Saturday night, the story of the Jewish people being enslaved in Egypt for, for 400 years and finally coming out of that slavery some three and a half thousand years ago. We have the holiday that we just finished, the holiday of Purim, and many other holidays that we experienced throughout the year. Some of you may be wondering about the different Jewish traditions or the different Jewish styles of practice. Whatever those questions are, whether it's kosher, in fact, I was in Smith's today here in Jackson, and they have a great display of Passover items 
Many of the things stayed on them, not kosher for Passover, matzah, not kosher for Passover, gefilte fish. It's a very interesting thing. They couldn't realize, they didn't understand that there are items that are Passover oriented, but they're not necessarily kosher for Passover. And part of our job is to be able to share in a loving way the beauty of our tradition. So with that, I open it up to the public. If you have any questions about my experience here over the past 13 years, 14, almost 14 years, um, I'd be happy to answer those questions. Jordan, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Rabbi. Um, and we do have some questions coming in, so I would encourage folks to, to please keep writing those and we'll get to them um, as we can. I'll try to get to them in order. Um, one of the first questions comes from uh, Pam, Pamela, and she asks, um, how will our COVID concerns affect the celebration of the Passover Seder this month? Um, and, and I'd just like to add to that if I can, uh, just just for folks that might not be familiar, if you could just quickly, um, you know, as, as I guess as succinctly as, as it allows, um, just describe uh, Passover Seder and um, how COVID is sort of affecting those celebrations this year and last. Well, it seems that we lost Rabbi Mendelssohn. I see his connection got bad and he dropped out. I'm sure that he will try to um, attend. Oh, there he is. I lost you there for a moment. No worries. So to answer your question, Pamela, great question. Um, last year, in fact, my family uh, all have it. My parents came, joined us for Passover from Florida. And unbeknownst to them, they had covid either when they, before they traveled or on the plane they got it in the airport. And when they arrived several days later, we were all feeling sick. We went to get tested. And at that time in March, there wasn't any COVID thing option. So we tested for all other, other kinds of seasonal flus and coughs and colds. And we tested negative for all of those things. And then finally, when the tests arrived, we tested and we tested positive. So last year, Passover was our family by ourselves in total, complete isolation and separation. Many people from the community came to support us and brought us food and enabled us to be able to celebrate Passover uh, in isolation. It was a challenging Passover. It was the first year that we were simply by ourselves, but that's part of the reality in this COVID era. This year, I would like to, I guess, begin by sharing just a little bit of a background on Passover and what it means. So Passover celebrates the time when the Jewish people were slave in Egypt. The great Pharaoh enslaved the Jewish people. And after an extended period of slavery, the holiday of Passover celebrates the time when the Jewish people finally were able to leave the slavery in Egypt and find their freedom. This is one step towards freedom. I send out a weekly email, and this past week, the email that I sent to our community, and anyone's welcome to sign up to our emails, I send a weekly eTorah thought. It's a thought on the Torah portion. And if anyone would like to sign up, they can get in touch with Jordan, and he can pass along my intention. So the thought that I shared this past week was that freedom really doesn't only celebrate the ability to be able to no longer be enslaved to others, but rather how you use your freedom in a way that incorporates values and purpose. So you could be free from slavery, but still be enslaved to your own ego. You could be Well, it seems that we're having a little bit of trouble with his internet. I'm going to request that um, just to help with that, that, that when he gets on, we try to do without video and that we just are able to listen. Um, that might be easier for us, that sometimes that's a little trick. I'm sorry about this. Um, no worries. Um, if you want to just turn off your video and just do voice, that might be, maybe that's as better. We can try that. 
just if we can hear you, I think that's the, we'd love to see your face, but I think this will do. I can assure you my wife's face is a lot pretty. <laughs> um, yeah. But I, I completely understand. There's a deeper connection when you, uh, when you can see someone. Right. So in any event, um, so Passover celebrates this idea that you're not just free from slavery, but you've achieved a level of freedom through, the pur through purposeful living. In any event, um, Passover is celebrated each year by uh, more Jewish people than any other holiday throughout the year. It's a time of family gathering where we come together to recall this slavery and this sense of freedom by gathering for the, the famous Passover Seder dinner. Christians know about the Passover Seder dinner, also known as the Last Supper. But for Jewish people, we gather together, we eat unleavened bread called matzah, we drink four cups of wine or grape juice, we celebrate both this idea of freedom, but at the same time recognize the painful reality of slavery. And it's this tradition that incorporates many rituals, storytelling, family debate and discussion, open, this, open opportunities for each person to partake in the meal in a very vibrant, lively way. And it somewhat takes you back to thousands of, gener thousands of years, generation upon generation of Jewish tradition connecting one link in the chain of Jewish history to the next. It's a wonderful, wonderful celebration. And this year, what we are doing is we are encouraging people who are either elderly, sick, or are immunocompromised some way not partake in any Passover Seder dinner, whether it's with outside family members or friends, we are encouraging people that have already been vaccinated or have a doctor's note or a doctor's agreement for them to partake in a Passover Seder dinner to join with family and friends. And we are opening up our home. Typically, we do it in a much larger setting with 80, 90 people who join us from all across the state of Wyoming for a beautiful Pesach Seder dinner. We do it in a big hotel this year. We're just doing it in our home with a select group of friends who have already either been vaccinated or had COVID. And that's the way that we're, we're celebrating Passover this year. It's different, but we're making it work and the tradition continues on. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Dana Liebelson and she says, hello, Rabbi Mendelson, thank you for doing this. I'm a Jewish writer here in the MFA program at the University of Wyoming and I grew up in Montana, and her dad wanted to tell you that he was married by a Chabad rabbi, Rabbi Konikov. Uh, she's been searching for Jewish teachings that speak to the idea of wilderness and open spaces, as we have here in the Mountain West. Is this an idea that you think about, or does it bring any teachings into mind for you? So I didn't quite get the name. Was it Lisa? Uh, Dana. Dana. Dana, thank you very much for that. And uh, please tell your dad, Rabbi Konikov was my, is a dear friend and was my night activity director in a camp where I grew up uh, going to in Montreal, Canada. He's a wonderful guy and I'm glad that he had the opportunity to marry your parents. Um, as it relates to the Jewish experience in the West, the Jewish experience in the great outdoors and the Jewish experience in Wyoming, I certainly think that there are unique parallels between our traditions, the opportunities that they provide for spiritual living, and the greatness of the Wild West and the Western outdoors, the great outdoors. Um, if I understood your question correctly, I think that experiencing the deepness of Jewish spirituality in New York or in Jerusalem are in many ways more difficult than they are in Wyoming. Spirituality by nature is defined by that which one cannot touch, see, and feel. The awe-inspiring Tetons, the great beauty of Bighorn National Forest, the wide open spaces that define the greatness of the outdoors in Wyoming are in many ways the most spiritual experience that a person can have. I think it's far easier for someone who's disconnected from any form of religious spirituality 
to find a connection to God, to find a connection to spirituality in a place like Wyoming than it would be in the rat race of a large city filled with concrete. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question uh, from uh, Reverend Dr. Sally Palmer. And she is asking, I think she's asking about, um, you know, if you could say something uh, to your, your 13, 14 years here is where are the scattered Jewish communities in Wyoming? I know you touched on that and that there's the synagogue in Cheyenne, um, but if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the diaspora of Judaism in Wyoming and kind of uh, what, what that looks like and where there's pockets of uh, populations, if you can speak to that. Great question. So Wyoming has a book that was actually gifted to me um, uh, called The Jews of Wyoming. It was gifted to me by Cynthia Lummis. She was then Congresswoman Lummis. Now she's Senator Lummis. Uh, she gifted me that book, which talks about uh, the first Jews that settled Wyoming and were a part of building the beautiful state that we know of today. Um, today, there are, uh, there's a synagogue, a beautiful, vibrant, wonderful synagogue in Cheyenne that has been active for over 100 years. There's a synagogue in Casper that has been active for over 80 years. There is a vibrant Jewish community in Laramie, both the Laramie Jewish community and the Hillel on campus, which serves Jewish students at the University of Wyoming. And then there are uh, two active Jewish communities in Jackson, one led by myself and my wife, Razi, the Chabad Jewish Center, and one called the Jackson Hole Jewish Community. And each of these four areas have so much to offer relative to the size of the Jewish communities that it's beyond belief. I mean, there are ongoing courses and lectures and programs and holiday events and Hebrew school classes and all kinds of services that are available in each of these four areas. And then there are also pockets of Jewish people that I visit every year, for example, in Cody, in uh, Alpine, Wyoming, which is close by to Jackson, um, in places like Gillette, in Buffalo, in Sheridan, there's small uh, pockets of uh, Jewish populations. Rock Springs has a small population of Jewish people. Uh, Rollins has several Jewish people. In fact, uh, one of the people that runs the uh, museum in Rollins, uh, the, I think it's called the Wyoming Museum in Rollins, is a Jewish fellow who uh, will likely be joining us for the Passover Seder dinner this year. And so um, the, the, the Jewish community is uh, primarily located in those four cities, Cheyenne, Laramie, Casper, and Jackson. Uh, but there are scattered Jewish populations all throughout the state. Yeah, thank you for that. And our next question is, is pretty similar uh, it kind of jumps off of that pretty well. And so Marilyn uh, asks, in many of our communities, there are not many visible Jews or Muslims. How do you suggest that the majority of Christians uh, find ways to understand more of the others personally? So, how, uh, yeah. It's a great question. Um, and I think that one of the great things about uh, living in Wyoming is that, um, you get to know people based on people instead of based on a societal definition of a group of people. And so I would encourage you wherever you live to seek out people from different faiths and different backgrounds. And in fact, to seek out people from different Christian denominations. Because what I find is that sometimes within the Jewish community itself, there's an inability or a lack of curiosity to understand the different denominations within the Jewish community. I find that to be fascinating, important, and life-affirming when you get to know people from different backgrounds, different ways of understanding. In fact, I make it a point to study with Jewish people in our community who are highly educated in Jewish tradition, 
to learn more about their perspective, knowing full, uh, you know, full well that they're coming from an entirely different perspective than I am. And I learn from them and they learn from me and together we grow as human beings. But I would recommend getting to know someone in your community, you know, as was mentioned in Cheyenne, it's very easy. Make your way to the synagogue. Someone will warmly welcome you in. Call them now during COVID. You might not be able to get in for regular services now, but make a phone call. And I'm sure someone will be happy to introduce you to the community or to a family, which has a unique way to be able to share uh, Jewish tradition from, from that family's unique vantage point and perspective. And I think that that's the greatest way to learn about any religion. It's person to person to person. Um, obviously, if you're interested in theology or philosophy or history, you might need to speak to someone who's a little bit more versed and educated in that religious tradition. You can buy books to learn more. Uh, I have um, a list of books that I can send to Jordan who can pass it along to anyone who's interested for some primers on Jewish uh, tradition, which I think will help explain a lot of the uh, traditional Jewish values, ideas, holidays, uh, kosher food, um, you know, how we pray, why we pray, what the, what, what the purpose of all of the different traditions are uh, and rituals are. So um, if you live in Cheyenne, you have the synagogue there. If you live in Casper, you have the synagogue there. Laramie, look up the Laramie Jewish Community Center. In Jackson, look up the Chabad Jewish Center of Jackson Hole or the Jackson Hole Jewish Community. There are a lot of opportunities throughout the state. Yeah, and I should say that Jason Bloomberg, um, who's a lay leader at Mount Sinai in Cheyenne, um, has, has said in the chat too, that while, while right now, as with um, many uh, worshiping communities, their services are all online, you can always go to the website, www.mountsinaicheyenne.org, uh, and you can be requested to add it to the Zoom link, um, and they generally welcome everybody who wants to experience their worship services. And I know if you're in the Laramie area from personal experience, the Laramie Jewish community is very welcoming and opening as well with sharing their uh, food and traditions. Um, it's, it's been a great learning experience for me. So um, if we have any more questions, we have, we have another one here. We can still get to a couple more questions if you have time, Rabbi. Um, so if folks want to type those into the chat, that would be appreciated. We do have one question from uh, Johanna, and she asks if you could talk a little bit about Merkava mysticism. Wow, Johanna, you're uh, going straight for the, uh, I mean, straight for the, for the easy stuff. Thank you very much for making my life uh, simple and easy. I, what I'll do is, uh, Johanna, if you're interested in studying more about Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism, um, you can email me directly at rabbi at jewishwyoming.com. I'll be happy to answer your specific question. But what I will do is basically give a very brief overview of some of the ideas of the Merkava, <clears throat> mostly discussed in Ezekiel and then uh, highlighted and emphasized and discussed in greater detail in the Zohar and in many other texts of Jewish uh, mysticism. Um, the, the basic elements are as follows. Um, God is defined and described as number one being infinite, but on the other hand also having finite characteristics because the true definition of infinity is that it's truly could be everything, both infinite and finite. So for the finite side of things, there are descriptive definitions of God that can be defined as three intellectual characteristics and seven emotional characteristics, which are not directly, but indirectly highlighted in the story of the Merkava and Zimu. The three intellectual faculties are in fact Chabad. Chabad is the name of the organization that I run, but it's also an acronym for the three words Chachma, Bina, and Das, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. 
These are three intellectual powers that Kabbalistically is described to have infused within the world wisdom, purpose, and direction. Then there are seven emotional characteristics, totaling 10, the three intellectual and the seven emotional. The seven here are Chesed, Givura, Kiferas, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and Malchus, which loosely translated is affection, and um, Chesed is kindness or affection, uh, Givura, stringency or um, uh, harshness and limitations. Uh, Tiferes is beauty or harmony. Netzach is victory or the need to win, a winning characteristic. Hod is devotion and consistency. Yesod is foundation and communication. And Malchus is uh, defined as reality. And these seven emotional characteristics coupled with the three intellectual characteristics are the defined characteristics of God that he infuses within the world, the characteristics which then become part of the human characteristics as well, societal characteristics as well. I can describe this in greater detail and give more uh, of, a, uh, of a broader picture to help really explain all of this, but that would be likely a lecture of about four hours long. Um, we're we're going to stop here. Yeah, maybe maybe we can uh, save that for another time, perhaps. Well, last I, I put it on the chat. If uh, I put out a last call for questions, if anybody has any questions they'd like to hear um, anything from Rabbi Mendelson, please type them in the chat, and we can get to those um, as we close out our evening. Um, I, I do want to say real quick while we're waiting for maybe uh, one or two more questions here um, that the Wyoming Interfaith Network is helping sponsor um, an interfaith art exhibition um, from the nonprofit called Caravan. And the art exhibit is called Abraham Out of One Mini. And it's an artistic exploration of living harmoniously inspired by uh, Abraham, the common ancestor of the three celebrated Abrahamic faiths, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Uh, it will be coming throughout Wyoming. Uh, it has actually already started. It's in Rock Springs at Western Wyoming Community College. I will put some of this information in the chat so you don't have to memorize everything I'm saying or if you're furiously writing down. Um, it's currently in Rock Springs. And there's a few upcoming events um, that is going to be there. Uh, I believe it is there. Ooh, I shouldn't say unless I know. Um, but I believe it uh, is through the third there. And then it will be uh, opening in Laramie at St. Matthew's Cathedral on April 9th. And it will be then going to Lander starting on May 14th. And these are uh, three artists from the three Abrahamic faith traditions, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And it will be uh, this and many other events. You can find more information about uh, yointerfaith.org, um, the uh, Episcopal Diocese of Wyoming, among many other uh, community partners are help bringing this awesome interfaith exhibit to Wyoming. As I said, there's a lot of events that are surrounding that. Um, this being one of them. So I encourage you to check that art exhibition out if you are close to one of those three areas. And if you're not close to one of those three areas, luckily with the age of Zoom, we're going to be uh, live streaming many of those. So you'll be able to enjoy a lot of the events that we're bringing those along uh, in the comfort of your own home. So we have just one more question for you to close out the evening. Does that sound good, Rabbi? That works for me. I'm here as long as you need me. All righty. So uh, Kamaya asks, uh, what was one of your most meaningful experiences as the Chabad rabbi in Jackson? Hi, Kamaya. Great to hear from you. Um, so in terms of the most meaningful experiences that I've had here in Jackson, I mean, there are so many. It's just remarkable. Um, trying to think of something that really stands out as being over the top meaningful. Um, huh. One of my big philosophical um, ideals is that um, 
every ordinary day and every ordinary moment could be extraordinary. It's a matter of how you make that moment, how you infuse that moment with an overarching sense of meaning and purpose. Um, so I find that my days are filled with so many meaningful experiences on a regular basis. Um, trying to think, you know, there's, there's so many of them, uh, whether it's someone who's really elderly and, um, and this has happened on several occasions, coming to explore Jewish tradition for the very first time, uh, studying for their bar mitzvah at the age of 80. I mean, things like that are really touching and meaningful. Um, we've had, um, you know, so many personal family celebrations that we've had that were tremendously meaningful. My daughter's bat mitzvah last year was enormously meaningful. Um, you know, uh, driving cross state uh, in snowstorms to be able to celebrate with people their personal family celebrations or to unfortunately be at family uh, losses have been enormously meaningful. Um, the list goes on and on. It's really hard for me to think about the most meaningful experience that I've had. Kamea, you're getting me good over here. I'm usually the furthest thing from being speechless, um, but I'm trying to think of something over here. You, you got the rabbi speechless. Congratulations. Uh, that's almost unheard of. Rabbis are seldom speechless. The most meaningful experience in the last 13 years. Ha. Huh. Um, Kamea, the time that we spend together on a regular basis is always meaningful. Um, the work that we do over here, you know, I'll share with you something interesting that recently happened. I mean, there's so many different things. Um, we've been working on um, this annual project for the governor to proclaim uh, the Rebbe's birthday as Education and Sharing Day. And I recently hired a new executive assistant who's just getting used to a lot of our regular annual things that we do. And so she's a little bit behind on some of the programmatic things that we have consistently going on. And so um, as part of the the training period that she's in now, um, she's a little bit slower to take care of some of the acts uh, that we do on an annual basis. So instead of reaching out to the governor for the proclamation that we ask for every year for education and sharing day, a month ago, she reached out uh, within a month from the date that we need it. She reached out like two weeks ago to the governor's office. And the response that we got was the governor doesn't sign proclamations unless they're sent in at least a month before the date that you're requesting the proclamation for. It's part of procedure. It's part of the regular procedure. So I reached out to Superintendent Jillian Bailo, who's a good friend of ours, who's the uh, responsible party in the state of Wyoming for education. And I asked her if she might be able to have a word. Uh, with the governor, and she got back to me very warmly. Sure, we'll, we'll, we'll work this out. We'll figure it out. We'll get it done. And of course, she was successful with accomplishing that, and the governor signed the proclamation today. But in that process, uh, we got to talking about, um, about some efforts that I'm interested in on an education level to be able to bring uh, Jewish values to some degree or another to the public school system in the state, not in a religious way, not in a, a way to be able to uh, teach people about Judaism per se, but moral values that are universal in nature, but they, for me, are birthed in my Jewish experience and my Jewish study. And so one of the things that I will be working on at some point in the not too distant future, uh, together with some Christian friends, in fact, is to bring Holocaust education to the state of Wyoming, to the public school system. And this is something that's near and dear to me. And so um, in the process of working on this proclamation, so I was in touch with Jillian Balo about the proclamation, and then we're talking about Holocaust education, and she's 
um, interested in learning more about this and talked about a moment of silence in the public school systems and she has ideas and wants to see how we can implement that. And what I find is the most meaningful part about living in Wyoming is that you're dealing with real people. The, the process of large government systems and large communities often get, 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 you, you get lost in the behemoth of a system instead of being in touch with human beings. What I find as a whole is the beauty of the state of Wyoming is that every person matters. And for me, that's the most meaningful idea. It's based on the value in Genesis that says, every man is created in the image of God. Every person has infinite value and every single human being matters. And we have to cherish that and recognize how fortunate we are to live in such a special place. And um, so I hope that answered your question, Kamei. I'm sorry it was sort of rambling. That would be a short answer to my even longer rant I could have given. Well, we very much, very much appreciate you taking the time to, to answer the questions and to be with us uh, tonight um, in this conversation. Um, I, I, I always just think of how important it is that we um, understand each other better. And we live in such a small state, and yet it is still tempting and maybe easy to be able to pass by each other and not really um, stop and have conversations and understand um, sort of the richness and the spirit and particularly the spiritual and religious diversity of our state. So I really appreciate you, Rabbi Mendelssohn, for uh, being with us tonight. Thank you, Jordan, for having me. And thank you, everyone, for coming. It was really a pleasure to meet all of you. And with that, we will close out for the night. Um, I did want to say quickly, if you're interested in more of what the Wyoming Interfaith Network is doing, then you can check us out at yointerfaith.org. And if you want to see us keep doing events like this, then you can uh, go to that website and donate, yointerfaith.org slash donate, so we can keep doing these events. Um, I, I should mention that we have another one of these events coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, in April, on April 5th, um, we will be having a presentation uh, and a conversation with um, Dr. Muhammad Sali, and he will be talking about uh, um, being a Muslim in Wyoming, and we will have a conversation with him about that. Um, so once again, if you'd like to get updates about these events, if you liked this one and you want to make sure that you get notified for more, or if you're interested in volunteering with the Wyoming Interfaith Network, then you can go to yointerfaith.org and scroll down to the bottom of the page and there'll be a sign up for our newsletter and you can get connected there. Um, I think that's everything. Uh, thank you everybody so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time once again, Rabbi, and everybody, I hope you stay safe and take care. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you again, Jordan. Bye-bye.